So welcome back. I am in my daughter's room and we are sitting right in front of one of her bookshelves because one of her favorite things to do is to read stories. She loves to pick out books and read them with us before bedtime, before nap time, just during the day. She loves stories because I think it's true. We all love a good story. But what's important about a good story is the storyteller, right? You can have a good story, but if the storyteller just doesn't know the audience, it doesn't click. It doesn't work. And one of my daughter's favorite stories to read right now is Home Alone. Now, if you've seen Home Alone, you probably would say, yeah, it probably isn't a movie that a two-year-old should watch. It's pretty violent. I don't know how it got a PG rating, um, but that was back in those days. But what this is really cool about this story in this version of the Home Alone book is that the storyteller knows its audience. It knows its audience. It knows it's going to get the people that love Home Alone, the, the parents like me and my wife who grew up watching this movie, who love this movie and want to share this movie with their kids, but also knows the audience that there's probably going to be some kids that maybe the stuff that happens in the movie where they attack the burglars might be a little too intense for someone who's younger. And so what the storyteller does is it recognizes who its audience is and then it takes the time to make sure that it can construct this story in a way that's going to be helpful and beneficial to both different groups. And your both groups are going to be able to glean something beautiful out of this story. Those that knew it from a long time and those that might be coming in fresh and who are a little younger. And so that's what is so cool about a great storyteller is that they know their audience and they know how to shape the story to affect both of the groups of people that are listening or whoever is listening. And I think that's what we see today. And that's what Jesus was so good at. Jesus was a masterful storyteller. And he always told what we call parables in the Bibles, where usually his stories had a spiritual um, point that he, they were trying to get across. And Jesus does a, such a good job at knowing his audience and being able to say, this is what you both need to hear today. So, we're going to take some time now to dig into a parable that we just read in Scripture. And we're going to break it down a little bit more and see how the parable of the prodigal son relates to us today. And so Jesus tells this parable of the prodigal son in Scripture. In Luke, it starts out like this. It says that there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided up the property between them. So basically what the son is saying is he goes, hey dad, I know I'm going to get some money when you die. So how about you just give it to me now and we'll call it all good. And the craziest part of the story is that dad's like, sure, okay. Like, I don't think that typically would happen. Um, Kids, I don't think you can go home to your parents, you know, after seeing this and say, hey, mom, dad, I know I'm going to get money uh, after you pass away because of inheritance and stuff. So why don't you just give that to me now? Let me know how that works out if you try that, right? It's not going to work out well for you. I'm just going to let you know up front. But it then goes on and says this. It says, not long after that, the younger son set off with all that he had. And he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. So he basically is a guy who wins the lottery and just doesn't know how to manage his money, right? Um, he goes and makes some crazy big purchases because he has this influx of money all of a sudden. And he doesn't know what to do. And so he squanders it all. Scripture then goes on and says this. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. So literally, the son went from rich to broke. He went from having all that he 
could desire to longing to eat the food that was being fed to the pigs. And I think if the story ends there, it'd be a pretty bad story. Like, Jesus, why are you telling us this story? But it would also be a story that I think most of us would be like, okay, this is a kind of setting you up to say, hey, be wise, be smart with your decision. Don't squander, right? Like, I think if, if the story ended there, we'd be like, ah, oh, this is a, a sad story. But I think we would look at it as a mindset of, this is a parable being told of, you need to be smart with what you have, right? We would all go, okay, it makes sense. We understand that. And be grateful. You know, you could look at it like, he should have been grateful for what he had. And this is a parable for that. But the story doesn't end there. Scripture goes on to say this. When the younger son came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. No, I will go back to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. So he got up and went to his father. And so the young son realized that the servants were probably living better than he was. And so he had to make his way home and beg his father for forgiveness. And I think what we saw in scripture there is something, he's probably was doing something that we all do a lot. When we have to have those tough conversations with people, where we start to replay the conversation in our head. How, do we, how are we going to say this? Because we know we messed up and we need to ask for someone's for forgiveness. So we can replay this, whether we're walking around the house the night before thinking this or, or driving in our car to have that conversation. I think we see that the son is trying to figure out, okay, how do I say this to make my father forgive me? Because I think he, he goes, okay, it's my father. He's going to take me back, at least as a servant. He's not going to let me starve, but I'm not going to have the same wealth or status that I had before. And I think people hearing this story for the first time in the audience were probably thinking, we know where this story is going to go. The father's going to see him. He's going to give him a long lecture about, you know, how he should not have squandered his wealth and how hopefully he learned his lesson. And, you know, he's going to have to learn from his mistakes. And so he's going to have to, he's going to have to work, build that trust back up, earn that trust again, right? He's going to have to, he's not going to have that same status he had. Um, but he'll be able to, you know, work at his father's place and at least have a warm bed and some food for his stomach, right? And I think the audience is like, that's probably what's going to happen. And that's a good ending because honestly, he doesn't even deserve that, right? But that's not how Jesus tells stories because remember, Jesus is a masterful storyteller. So let's see what scripture says happens next. But while the younger son was off in the distance, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. You hear what scripture says here. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. As soon as he came into view, he was running to his son. He didn't wait for his son to get to him. He didn't give his son a chance to say a word. He wrapped his arms around him and gave him a kiss. But the son had his speech prepared, right? Father, I've sinned against you and heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father cuts him off. He says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and celebrate. And then he says this. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The son, see, he expected to be treated like a servant, but the dad wasn't having any of that, right? He gave him a robe. He gave him a ring. He said, he basically was saying, all is forgiven. Forget about that. I don't care about the mistakes you made. I care about you and I see you. I think now is a good time to remember that there were really two different parties in the crowd, in the audience that Jesus was speaking to. You had your unbelievers who hadn't really heard a story like this before, that there, were no, there was no punishment for his, 
for his mistakes. And that there was no physical distance between the father and son. Like, all was forgiven? This is something that I think unbelievers really had never heard a story like this. And I think the religious leaders in the story were like, wait a second. Doesn't this make the father look bad? Like, there should be some type of penalty for this. You're just going to encourage bad behavior later. He should have to pay for what he does. There should be some distance between the father and son. He's going to need to earn back. Like, I think the religious leaders were saying, like, no, come on. This isn't how it's supposed to go. But Jesus wasn't done telling the story, was he? He talked about the older brother next. And he heard, the older brother heard there was a party being thrown for his little brother. And this is what scripture goes on and says. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been working for you and I never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened cat for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So we know the father enjoyed the party. We know the younger son enjoyed the party, but we really don't know what happens here with the older son. We don't know if he decided to go into the party and enjoy it, or if he stayed outside and was gonna be bitter. We don't know. And I think what we honestly can say though too is, most of us probably understand the older brother where he's coming from, the frustration that he's feeling. Like it makes sense for us. And we, we understand how he was, why he's been out of shape about this situation. And that's what makes this story so great. And it one that's so hard to forget and why I think it's sold so much. Because Jesus is speaking to two separate groups in the audience, right? The unbelievers and the believers. However, the unbelievers and the believers both understand and both think, yeah, the younger brother should not have been rewarded for his actions. If you're listening to this story, you would agree like, yeah, he... He messed up. He should not get rewarded. And we would all kind of side with the older brother. Like, he should be the one getting the party. He's done everything right. He's done everything that's being asked of him. But the party's for the younger son. And Jesus tells it in this way that unbelievers and the believers both agree of like, this is not what should happen. But that's why Jesus is a masterful storyteller. But that's not how the story goes, right? Because the younger brother didn't do anything in his life to fix it before he got to party, right? He didn't even really get to ask for his father's forgiveness before his father cut off and was like, no, we're throwing you a party. And what Jesus is doing here is he's reminding people who, who think they might not be qualified to follow Jesus because of their past mistakes. And he's reminding them that you don't have to be fixed to be found. And I think what Jesus is saying to the religious leaders here is, you don't get to decide how thick someone has to be before they can be found. And the incredible thing about this story is it still matters today. For people who think they've messed up too much or have gone too far down the road, too many bad things that Jesus could never forgive them. Jesus is saying, I'll never give up on you. And he's reminding us as a church that no matter where someone is at, no matter how far down the road someone has been, that we as a church cannot give up on those that are lost. And that we also have to remember that we don't get to decide how thick someone has to be before they're found. Right? The lost son did not come back with everything perfectly put back together. And what Jesus is saying here essentially is no one loses their value because they've lost their way that you are worthy to be found. So who are you in the story? Are you the younger brother? Are you sitting there saying, I don't think I'm good enough to be found. I'm, you don't know my past, you don't know my life. 
And are you needing someone to remind you right now that you don't have to be fixed to be found? Are you needing someone to run to you, to hug you, to kiss you, and say, I accept you for who you are. God accepts you for who you are and wants to be in a relationship with you. Doesn't care about your past. Doesn't care about what you've done. He cares about what you can do. And that God desperately desires to be in a relationship with you. Or maybe you're the older brother or the religious leaders. And in this story, we need to remind ourselves that people don't have to be fixed to be found. I think this story is such a beautiful telling of a father seeing someone who is lost and just hugging them and embracing them. He didn't ask him, hey, do you have everything figured out yet? Do you have everything in line before we can ex- I can fully accept you for who you are? No, he didn't care. All he knew is that his lost son was coming home. And I think that's an important reminder for us as the church. How can we create an environment where lost people found, feel found? Where can we create an environment as a church where people who don't have it all together, who don't have everything fixed in their life, can still feel found. And I think this is a reminder for us because if we're honest with ourselves, church, those of us who are in relationship with God, we're still not fixed. But the difference is we know we're found. And we are able to embrace that and enable to embrace God's love. And so how do we share that with our brothers and sisters that don't know that truth? That God loves you for who you are no matter what you've done. And it's important for us to remember that you don't have to be fixed to be found. You don't have to be perfectly clean to go home. You can go home messy. And that the Father will still receive you. He will redeem you. And He will restore you. Amen. Let's continue our worship now.